Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, the podcast that is saying its long, final, heartbreaking goodbye. It's not really heartbreaking. It's just we're ending a great run. Yes. And much like the movie, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which is (laughs) 68% fresh on the tomato meter. This is just going to be a fun, rollicking episode where we get to look back on some of the great uh, movies we've talked about, some of the amazing guests we've had, the wonderful team that has made myself and Jacqueline Coley look like we're good at this for the last Seriously. three, four yeah. years. That is Jacqueline Coley. And and Jacqueline, you and I have been on this ride for so long, and it's just been such a, a, a rewarding feeling to get in here to the studio, whether it was our personal studio at home, whether it was on the other side of town, whether it's here, and get to just do what we love doing, talk movies with each other. Yeah, it really has been nice to just, I will say this, I'll be happy to see you now in a more like (laughs) intentional social setting, Mm -hmm. because it was sort of like, I know everything going on with Mark because I see him every other week or every week. Now it's like, we can go back to those days where we were like, we got to make like a, not an Arcolite date, I guess now it's a we got to make it an AMC <laughs> date, but we got to like make an intentional thing to hang out. It'll be nice to to put our friendship back to the way it started, which was me going and visiting you on the patio of the comedy store. Yeah, well, you know what's going to be really fun about that is that you're always welcome on the patio, but we're probably, the next time we see each other, because we just went over our travel schedule, since yeah. Jacqueline and I like to joust with our frequent flyer miles. Yes. Um, I, the next time we see each other, I'm, I'm going to put money on it right now. You know where it's going to be? In an airport lounge. It's going to be us walking the dogs to the coffee shop yeah, that is oh. the median between our two places. Fair. Because it's happened before. It's happened a it number has, of times. I've seen you walking your dog. I think you've seen me. Mm-hmm. It, that, is, that is actually true. We got to get the dogs uh, to do a little like little, little, <laughs> little play date. Just like the 40-somethings that we are. I don't know that it, Molly loves a good play date. I think she enjoys hanging out with other dogs, but she's just kind of like, all right, you run around and do your thing, and I'm just going to sit here and... <laughs> Take a drag and take a nap and, and it'll be okay. Yeah, and my dog will be like, no, we're not going to take that energy. We're going to have to take it to a 10. Because, like, he's chill inside the house. You get him to a dog park, mm-hmm. it is in the streets, as we like to say. I love it, man. I love it. And that's that's sort of the energy that Jacqueline and I bring to the podcast, this divergent approaches to life. And it just all meshed in Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong in the most beautiful way where we got to welcome on so many special guests, some celebrities, and we got to talk movies and basically defend a movie if we thought it was wrong by the tomato meter or take a movie down a peg if we thought it's a little too big for its britches up there on the tomato meter. And one of the great reasons that we wanted to do a farewell episode is because it's not just you and me who we're still going to see each other all the time, but it's this incredible crew that surrounds us that really helped get this thing off the ground during the pandemic. And so joining us today is a number of special luminaries. The first one of which is, you know, her as producer Lucy. And I, my first question to you, Lucy, is you did not come up with the name Producey Lucy. That was actually like what either Jack or myself I messed it up, tried yeah. to say it really fast. I said Lucy, producer Lucy, and I accidentally <laughs> said Producey Lucy. And I was like, that's, that's, that's absolutely going to track now. And it works and it stayed that way. And I think it's all encompassing about that. A mess up leads to a happy ending, like a souffle. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That was beautiful. I, you yeah. told me on one episode, I have I have something to share with you. So the following episode, you said it. And I remember grinning like an idiot. I was like, I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> How did I not figure this out before? I think we got a text on the group text. It was like, thank you. Thank you for yeah. my nickname. And yeah. we're like, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I guess. sure. It, I guess. Stick. <laughs> I'm easy to please. Yeah. It, it, it's good to be here with you guys. I think, um, you know, during the pandemic, they, you know, I'm a producer. I don't edit. <laughs> which is rare for our team. Normally, it's producer editor. Mm-hmm. And so my boss at the time was like, uh, we don't really have anything for you to do. And I was like, here we go. I'm going to get the like, it's time to go. Mm-hmm. And or you got to learn how to edit. Yeah, exactly. Which, you know, I, I tried. Yeah. On the early episodes, I, I did edit those and it took me a week. You got to learn mm-hmm. Final Cut Pro. Yeah. yeah. Thank God Avid, for Brian Perez, things. honestly. But ultimately, they were like, we need a podcast. So... It turned into the, like, it went from scary to like, oh, hell yeah, this is going to be fun. And it was. 
Yeah. And then it was during the pandemic, so you had to get me away from my busy wee golf schedule, and we had to make sure <laughs> that we could do this thing virtually. And so yeah. I really think, and that's what we're going to do today, is just kind of go uh, over some of our favorite episodes, some of our favorite moments with some of our favorite people. And I think that what I loved about this podcast initially was just that Jack and I were already great friends. We knew each other. And so it's very tough to have chemistry with anyone anyway, even if you're in the same room with them. And to be virtual and just to do it over the web, the World Wide Web on the information superhighway. It's like, <laughs> I don't know this person, but but Jack and I already got along. So I don't think that was ever like even no. an issue for us. Yeah, no. And I would say I've done this with people that I didn't know as well. And it was like, it was like, I already knew we were cool, but I became incredibly grateful when I realized, oh, thank <laughs> God I'm here with somebody that's going to be like calm. And honestly, look, three and a half years ago, but really I give it the four years because man, did we like pilot and pre, um, oh, like pre-production yeah. and like, just like getting it through all of the corporate sort of like loopholes we had to get it through before you guys finally got that episode <laughs> on September because we were workshopping this before the pandemic started. We were first yeah. talking about it in like January. Okay, so I repressed all that stuff from my memory yeah. because I did I, not. I looked at the date. <laughs> it's with you still. Yes. She's lies awake and I'm going, oh, uh, Space As Brian Jam. always do, does a wonderful job with the show notes, uh, I'm I'm looking at it and it said that we premiered three and a half years ago on September 17th, 2020. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like, I thought we started earlier than that. And yeah. I guess we did. We, no. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> a year earlier, right? Almost a year earlier was the first conversations. And then we got in with the folks at Art19 and everything like that. But I remember we did our first, I would say, like pre-production meetings while we were still in the office. And so that was before March. That was before we sort of like closed down. Because I'll never forget that day. Everybody was like, yeah, we'll be back. And like everyone left their desks like normal. Like they didn't, un they didn't undo them. You know right. what I mean? Like Food. everything was, everything was just Stayed. the way that it was. And I was the first person to be like, we're not coming back. <laughs> I held on. I was like, please God, don't let this be a thing. I kept telling everyone, no, because South by Southwest yeah. was coming up and we were going to do a big show. And, uh, I kept telling everyone, no, no, it's not. This isn't a big deal. Everyone relax. This isn't real because I really wanted to produce the show. <laughs> but you're also, canceled. and I found, like, no. I found this out about you today and I've known this about you for years and I get reminded every so often, you love coming to work. You love getting into the office oh, yeah. and you love the FaceTime and that's where, that's where Lucy thrives. Yeah. I, I need people. What's going so, on at home? Yeah. I, I have children. <laughs> This is a vacation. I like hanging out with you guys more than there. You know, I, I love my kids. But I mean, but, it's a but, but you definitely should leave, like, leave for, like, leave room for the love, yeah. as they say. Mm -hmm. People always say, how do you do it? Well, how do you work and have kids? I'm like, um, because you have the kids and then you have someone watch them and then you get to go do the fun movie and TV stuff. Like Rotten Tomatoes is so fun to work for because yeah. we get to. We did do this. Yeah, this and it talk was, about movies. This and, is fun. And it's fun to talk about movies and yeah. have the angle, not just like, oh, I love this part or I love this part, but like, why is this movie perceived this way yeah. Yeah. by the masses or particularly by a wealth of critics who right. watch a bunch of movies? That's their job. Why did the, the wide swath of critics feel this way about a particular movie? Is there a movie, Lucy, that you can look mm. back over our past three and a half years and yeah. say... Like, were you surprised by anything? Was there even just a movie that, like, you were aware of and you looked it up for a possibility to be on the show and you're like, I can't believe it's that high or it's that low? The two that stick out to me are The Mummy and the and Spaceballs. So mm. those episodes, I loved being a part of those just from the behind-the-scenes angle. It did shock me because in the 90s, 90s Mummy came out, 1999. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I remember being a kid and that was such a huge film and we would, like, play that game after mm. we saw the movie like it was a big deal so when I found out it was rotten I was like what the hell <laughs> this is so strange to me and we had uh, our friend Eric Striffler on for oh that my God. episode and he, yeah. had the shirt on. he wore his mummy shirt yeah. and ever since that episode that, so that's good. a pretty big one in my history yeah. too because mm. ever since that episode I never noticed the mummy fandom before we did that episode yeah. Yeah. and then Striffler's great at just gushing about the stuff he loves which is in abundance yeah. and ever since then I'll see like a car with like a bumper sticker that says, I still defend the 1999 mummy. And like, I see all these and I'm like, where are these things coming from now? Yeah. Now my, I guess my antenna is tuned in to look at all the mummy references that people put out there in the world. Oh yeah. I Especially mean, the bisexual film. awakening. That's like a key one. <laughs> yeah. that, like everybody talks about is like, this movie gave me my bisexual awakening. Yeah. I, I don't know if I have. Oh, because of Rachel Weiss? Both of them. Because it was like, people were uh, attracted to both. 
Brendan Both Fraser her and Brendan Fraser and Rachel yeah. Vice. And yeah. I'm gonna throw. Pairing. Yeah, the, I'm tossing Arnold Vosloo in there too. Absolutely. Ooh, yeah. And absolutely. his little soft. That's what we talked about. His soft. His his soft uh, dad his bod. is yeah. kind of sexy. Bald what head. what is yeah. the name of the guy? He was also in Lost, and he plays the guy that like rescues them. The he's like the leader of oh, the. Yeah. yeah. He's another one. Like yeah, that pretty, movie is just daddy. like bangers of hot people. The girl that plays yeah. the Knox in a Moon. Another oh, one. Sh- yep. Pause Vega. L'Oreal model. Absolutely. So basically, if we go girls. to a party, we go to yeah. like a cast and crew party celebrating the 1999 film The Mummy. Mm-hmm. Whoever we go home with from that party, we're going to have a good time. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think that's You're absolutely true. You're going to have a true. great time. Yeah. It's hard not to fall in love <laughs> yeah. when you're watching The Mummy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, I remembered very little about that movie other than that was the practice movie for me because it came out <laughs> a few weeks before The Phantom Menace did. Oh. So my brother and I went to the theater to see The Mummy because it looks like a cool movie, but we're also looking around. We're looking like, okay, this is the theater where Star Wars is going to be happening. Yeah. So yeah. What, what, what's the Big best deal. seat? Where should we, like, what's the best angle? What's the best snacks to get? How early do we have to get here? It was, it was training camp for (laughs) Star Wars episode one. I would hope so. I mean, that's, that's not saying something though, for knowing that he was really like preparing to go to war (laughs) is what you should have been doing because that's what it ended up being. Um, I will say this. I was thinking about this question that you asked her on the way up here. And it with mine is it's on, it's on like two sides of it. I still to say, and granted, this is actually a testament to the show. I still to this day cannot figure out why people went in on the Eternals the way that they did. Oh. Like I just watched it the other day on Disney Plus and yeah. it's not a perfect movie, but I compared that to like Madam Web and I'm like, <laughs> <You're> like excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, or comparing yeah. it even to like some of the more earlier iterations of Marvel, like it just, it, I can't understand how that movie was so low. There's so much good acting in it, too. Yeah. I mean, like, even, like, The Dark World, which was, like, barely <laughs> rotten or barely fresh. Like, yeah, the fact right. that this movie is considered infinitely worse yeah. to that one, which, like, I Well, that's yeah. the fun of this show, too, is yeah. that you take movies that are all in the same franchise, right. and then you start comparing the tomato meter against each other. Because it's like, yeah. you look at something, you say, how is that lower than this? Yeah. Right. This like, makes no sense. How's I, how's Paddington? Was it Paddington 2's like a hundred <laughs> and Citizen Kane? Go, well, that's a big deal. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, love that. <laughs> that's one are... of the all-time great tomato meter debates. <laughs> Is Paddington actually better <laughs> than Citizen Kane? Listen, as as our as our second guest today, I think we'll attest to that. <laughs> One thing I learned about this show he can is, is, us. is uh, he will. I can already feel it. Uh, I literally can. It is a snapshot. <laughs> and the snapshot is is much more of a reflection of the times. It's much more yeah. a reflection of the taste of the times. And the taste of the times are not meant to be progressive. It's not if a movie is going to be a movie that the next generation loves, the current generation is probably not going to dig it in the same way. And there's like countless examples of that. You know what I mean? Like even yeah. something like Goodfellas that like, The people of that time appreciated, but they didn't love it the way it ended up being this sort of like cultural shift in cinema the way that we did. Right. No one knew when Goodfellas came out, nobody was watching that movie. And they said, oh, this is it. I mean, they watched and they said this is another great Scorsese banger. But nobody said this is going to be on cable every weekend for the rest of cable's life. (laughs) And then it's going to go to every (laughs) streaming platform and people are just going to watch this movie nonstop. People didn't know. It's like there's an alternate universe where we're doing that with Dances with Wolves. Yeah, instead. it's sad. Where it's like, oh, Dances yeah. with Wolves is on. I can't go anywhere for the next three hours. <laughs> Nothing against Dancing with Wolves, but think about the cultural significance, the impact, and how often you think about a movie like Goodfellas or what it means to the zeitgeist. And think about the last time. The last time I probably thought about Dancing with Wolves is when they put it on the trailer for Horizon. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, oh it's like, gosh. oh, he made that too. I forgot that he made that. I forgot that that was a thing yeah. because that and Last of the Mohicans and Braveheart, those were all movies of that time. There also, you go. have you guys ever noticed with those films, especially Kevin Costner films, which I love you, Waterworld, but like anytime he's like, that, that was your produ- magnum opus episode. Oh, was, was when we did Waterworld. I go to every time I go to Universal Studios, I see that show two to three times. Wow. That is a family favorite. <laughs> um, but Kevin Costner, love him. But also, Dances with Wolves and other films that he's in, I'm always like, why is there a seven-hour sex scene in this? <laughs> he's always like, and then there will be a sex scene, and it will be very real, and I, I will be, You'll not give me on that one. I, I think I, I think I, obsessed. I, Luckily, I they edited it. out of Field of Dreams when he hooks up with Shoeless Joe for 10 minutes. <laughs> that in the cornfield. Best comedy bit in the that I've seen in years was Mulaney describing that movie. He has, At like, the Oscars. He, oh, my God. That was good. I, I will say this because 
because he's still my pick to to host the night. Like, get more dark with your backstory, dude. It just makes you a better comic. <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, you're going to leave this one, too? Like, it'll be a great special. That's what I plan on doing after, the, after this podcast. I'm just going to go into a dark hole and just be a, just be a filthy heathen for a and few months. And then go to and... rehab, come out, and then you'll be hosting the Boom. Oscars. Now I'm hosting now, the Oscars. And the, you're coming with me, Jacqueline. The student of comedy that you are, I think you can appreciate. It's so much funnier that he uses the actors' real names. It, he doesn't use the characters' names. It's like you have to actually say Timothy Buzzfield. You have to say Amy, Abby Hoffman because that is what makes it even funnier. That's what you and I, and, and I remember Lucy, like we met talking about like, how do we approach doing this podcast? Do we, yeah. do we have to say the characters' names? <laughs> do we say the yeah. actors' names? I think we all just landed on, let's just do what feels natural yeah. to us because that's, what more often than not, it. that's what the listener yeah. Yeah. is doing as well. Yeah. Like if I just said Ray Kinsella, you may be like, wait, that guy, is that is that Kevin Costner? <laughs> no. is, that, is, that, is that James Earl Jones? It's like, you have to know who these people are. And so right. again, we're, we're doing this podcast for the masses. I am, and I consider myself a member of them. And exactly. so I want to be as relatable as possible. Right. So sometimes you seamlessly go from saying, oh yeah, Kevin Costner and Field of Dreams. But then if we're talking about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, <sighs> I'm just saying Robin Hood the whole time. Exactly. Or, or the fact that Lucy, I think in the Eternals episode, only referenced uh, Richard uh, Madden <laughs> as Rob Stark. As I Rob think Stark? I, yeah, we just called him <laughs> Rob Stark. We didn't even call him by Let his actual name. Yeah. And we also called uh, Kit Harrington <laughs> Jon Snow. Yeah. We both of them Who's are- Who's Kit Harrington? <laughs> they just are their character names. But I know that, not. But that is the beauty of the show. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of our audience because yeah. I don't think, look, they they went with us on that yeah. one. But I want to ask you, what we was your down. what was your sort of like disbelief pick? Um, after watching Sister Act two, I could not oh. believe how it was that low. Yeah, because like I had seen it and then I I just completely kind of forgot about it. You know, it was like, oh yeah, it's another nice entry in the in whatever this this is going to be. <laughs> And then to see it was like 17% or something when we did yeah. it. And I was like, what, what, what is, even if the movie felt like it was just like a, another sequel mm. to crank out, right. like there's nothing about that movie that should be anywhere close to that low. And it has since rebounded. And that's another one of the fun things about doing this show is yeah. you kind of get the word out to the masses like, hey, maybe we'll yeah. get some fresh perspective on this and maybe even turn a movie from rotten into fresh. The, yeah. the, the t- but ultimately the tomato meter is living. It moves yeah. with the with the time. It's a living, and it's, breathing it's a, thing. It's a living constitution, yeah. like the British, you know. And I think that's pretty cool. I also remember the blacklist guy, um, Bill. Oh yeah, uh, Franklin Leonard. Franklin mm-hmm. Leonard. I think originally Joel Mears, who had been with us, he was our editor in chief back in the day. He was talking to Franklin Leonard. And was like, you have to come on and do Sister Act two, and he was like, no, no, I know a lady. Her name is Mikeiko James. You got to get mm-hmm. her here. She was a great guest. I just yeah. remember being like. I really like, this is a fun podcast. This is fun. Yeah, because the idea was percolating before that moment, but that movie was just sort of the perfect movie to encapsulate what we talked about, this sort of idea of like, hey, this is a movie that there's still a lot of conversation around it. Is it is it worthy of being canonized? Is it one that people didn't give it its fair shot for whatever reason? But the thing I also sort of loved about the podcast is just like the site and just like the tomato meter, it's matured past that. Mm-hmm. And now we're at a point now where it's like, yeah, the conversation is a part of it. But the more interesting thing is, well, why was it like that? Why or why was that? Like when we look back on the 90s and how maybe sex was very prevalent in society, comparing that to now where you every movie looks like a Leave it to Beaver episode that says more about <laughs> right, right. it says more about the sentiments of the times. Because yeah. I will also add that I felt I held it down for the horny people on this podcast. And I'm OK with that. <laughs> I am OK with that. I read romance and it's like I don't care because being thirsty on Maine is your God given right. Do you remember you the go. horniest episode? Like for you, what was I forget what movie it was, but there was one where I was like, holy sh- <laughs> I don't. They all kind of bleed together that yeah. way because that's just like, that's sort of like the white noise of my existence is. Um, I feel undercurrent. like I feel like Jack was really in her element. Um, yeah. to her and Steph Sabra talking about Twilight. This is true because that's why. The, true. The, and and I give Steph a lot of credit because she's sort of like like sort of it enlightened me to a different way to look at Twilight. Yeah. She's mm. like, Mark, you ha- you can't watch this as as the dude that you are. Right. It's like you're watching this movie and all these like crazy cuts and like things they're doing because it's from the perspective of a very like scatterbrained high school girl who's going it's through a, a lot of changes. It's a 13 year old girl that wants yeah. a boy to bite her. Like, yeah. come on. Ooh. Like, this is, this is a different vibe. But yeah. 
I will I will take that vibe every time. Yeah, so, I, I want to get more movies from from both of us that like we're like, oh, that really was like kind of either changed my tune or something that we kind of uh, dug our heels in. But I we, we do have other guests coming in yes. today. Lucy, before we say goodbye to you for now, yeah. I wanted to kind of give you the floor to, yeah. you know, kind of give us your your closing sort yeah. of thesis about what the show has been and what it's meant to you, because you've been such a wonderful producer for us and oh, there's no other person that I think could have gotten this thing off the ground the way that you did working in concert with Joel and with Jack and myself it's just it, you did an incredible job even Thank though you, you had to do the majority of it from home which yeah. we know you hate being in. yeah I do it was hard but I just want to say working with you guys over the last four years you know it was a dark time as we all know but I got to know both of you better I know we had ups and downs in terms of just production and like everyone's feeling it this was a light, I think, even for me in my day to be able to just sit for an hour when we started recording, to be able to connect over things that humans in general, we love watching movies. So to be able to talk about that for an hour once a week was like, it was very meaningful to me and mm. you guys killed it. And I think you guys have grown tremendously and it's been a total honor. And then I also just want to give a shout out to our fans. I, I, read a lot of emails. <laughs> and we have some incredible fans, you know, Philip Calderon, Daniel Kessner, all these people that they were in our comments. And thank the fresh you. The ketchup the, crew. The ketchup crew. You guys were the heart and soul and you guys loved Jacqueline and Mark and it just felt like a family. Mm -hmm. So I thank you and I love you. Aww. And have a nice life. But there is <laughs> one more thing we need you there to is. do because yeah. if you're a listener to the show at all, you may all, not know this. You've heard the voice of Producey Lucy on every episode, even after she was no longer Producey and she was just Lucy or Luce Magoose, if you know her really well. Yeah. You've heard her on every episode. And I guess to help introduce our next guest, Lucy, you have the floor. Two men's with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> With that introduction, he's got legs, ladies and gentlemen, and he's sitting down for... Hi. He's a real person! <laughs> he How's is a real person! He's not just a voice! How's he's not some AI that we plug in and we say, hey, tell us what the critics were saying at this time when this movie was released. He is the the wonder kind, the, the uber collector of data <laughs> and reviews here at Rotten Tomatoes, our expert review curation manager. Tim Ryan is in studio. Yeah. Thank you so much for that intro, you two. <laughs> you have such a soothing voice when you're talking about the time, and, and it's almost like I'm, I'm sitting on your knee and you're telling me about a simpler time when, when this movie was released or back in the 80s or whenever the movie came out, and it just gives us such great context for this show. Um, but you were really with us from the beginning. I mean, you were part of this whole iteration mm. of you know fertilizing the waters that would become Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was crazy because it was in the midst of the pandemic and we're all sitting in our houses and Joel hits me up and says, hey, we got this podcast. He's like, you're going to hit the title. I'm like, what's the title? He's like, <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. I was like, I hate it. <laughs> but I mean, and the, the, but, you're the, wait, we have to be clear. This is a man that has lived and breathed the tomato meter, its efficacy <laughs> and its like reality for better part of two decades. So. No, but then, yeah, right. Well, I appreciate that. The, 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 the part that he pitched it to me was what's the afterlife of a movie or what's the extended life of a movie once it's released to you know, years later. And I was intrigued by that. And that's what I, what sort of got me up in the morning every time we did one of these things. What's really funny is, I wish Lucy was still here so I could say it, but like there were points where there's so few people you were talking to. Yeah. And Lucy was like, once a week, once every two weeks, we would just talk. During the pandemic, yeah. For yeah. like, an hour and then be like, oh, we got to record this. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> necessary it's like, time, necessary time. Mm -hmm. And so we do this whole show and like, it's almost like I'm, you know, tossing up the tennis ball and then one of you shows up and hits it, but it's not, you know, that's really a tribute to our team. And I got to get up to Brian too, because if you listen to the very early episodes, I am totally freestyling. <laughs> and Brian was like, dude, this is going to go a lot quicker if you uh, write it down. So then I was like, okay, I listened to a bunch of NPR and old no, episodes you have of Dulcet. Pauline Kale and I was like he has a very <laughs> NPR kind no, of soothing yeah. voice dulcet I tones it. man it was comforting because you set the tone I don't think you appreciated for the episode a lot of times I would come in with like 
fire, brimstone, or sometimes just a little bit on the other side being really like, I don't know if I have a strong opinion about this, but you would say a quote or you would talk about something that happened at that time or you would give us some sort of historical context. You'd be like, oh, I can I can, I can can latch on to this. I can it, talk it was, about this. Doing the show is a lot like going to the gym and it's like you just got to get warmed up. Yeah. So Jack and I knew all we had to do was get to the two minutes with Tim segment because then we turn it over, we get to listen to Tim and the guest is warmed up and everybody's loose and now we're like, all right, let's go, let's go do some yeah. heavy lifting here. You have yeah. no idea how much I appreciate that and listen to you you two bounce off each other was just like a delight too so it's just like I yeah I mean it I can't believe we made it this long yeah but it's also yeah. like you I mean not just because it was the depths of the pen not not that that sounds wrong. I guess what I'm saying is, is depth of the pandemic that, that like makes it and that look, long. We exactly, made it right? Four years total. I'm, again I'm keeping this four years because also April we're now in April. This will come out in mid-April. And we started in September. That's almost like we're getting yeah. we're getting close here. You know what I mean? What is that? Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight. And then that's the ninth month. That's that's over a year. That's a year and three quarters. And there was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, there, yeah, there were yeah. a lot of seeds being planted and stuff like that. Girl. But I will say, um, have you, for the four years that we've had, most podcasts don't make it to four episodes. We made it to four years. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I appreciate anybody that reached out. I'm curious for you, Tim, though. Did you have anybody uh, say anything about Rotten Tomatoes is wrong to you outside of the walls of Rotten Tomatoes? My parents thought I was oh, pretty good. <laughs> that's a good one. I like you know, hearing like, that. And, yeah. and, and it's also one of those things where just because I know how how precious the tomato meter is in, in these halls and that, you know, it was nice to kind of have a wink and a nod with it. But when you're like at a holiday party and people find out you work at Rotten Tomatoes, does it just like, do you just want to go like stand in the corner when, when people are like, I can't believe they gave Transformers that or like I, th if they don't understand how the tomato meter works? So yeah. this is the thing that I always say is that, uh, sorry to go back to the very beginning here. Please do. Um, so I've been working on a project called RT Archives. And the basic idea is uh, going back and finding reviews from when the movie came out. So The Godfather came out on a date in 1972 and people reviewed it and they gave their opinions, and they had not seen it on cable. Right, they had right. Not, the very earliest review I've been able to find was in November of 1897. Wow. What? For a film called The Horitz Passion Play. It is the filming of a passion play in purported to be in Germany, although I think they might have fudged it a little bit. Um, and there's a guy, anonymous, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who writes about going to see this, <laughs> And like, you know, the pictures are most lifelike. And like, this is a guy seeing an idiom possibly for the first time. Right. Wow. Right. And though it's not, it's not like we're talking like Ebert or Pauline Kael or something like that, but the guy, you get, you get a guy in a room at the birth of a thing. Yeah. This guy does not know. <laughs> he doesn't know what it's going <laughs> to become. No, right. Nor, not only does he not know what it's going to become, he doesn't know that like 125 years later, some guy is going to be like, I found this on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to put it on a website. Um, there's this really funny thing that I found from a newspaper in 1920 where this woman named Harriet Underhill was one of the first regular, a lot of the early film critics were women, by the way, yeah. which is awesome. Um, it's awesome to go back and find these voices um, that, you know, in a lot of cases, like people don't really know about. And it's been really fun for me to, you know, find this stuff. She was writing about all the hate mail she was getting for disliking, I think, a movie called The Tiger Cub. Oh, wow. Which you will never see because it burned up in a fire at some point. Like, it's a lost film. But people seem to love it. But people at the time were writing her nasty letters about, how did you like this, but not like this? So this goes back to, like, 1920? <laughs> the the 19... dawn of the internet I found, trolls. I yeah. found a review, for, uh, I found a, a poem written to a film critic for, yeah. the, for the now-defunct Chicago Examiner newspaper Dissing film critics in 1915. Yeah. You hear that, trolls, with your yeah. with, with your ridiculous comments. I've seen this poem. And I, your, I, your, I, your misspelled <laughs> words and your horrible grammar. Back in the day when they were trolling people, they wrote poems about them. Yeah, yeah. Write that's me a right. poem that's, that's right. trolling me and I'll be happy. No, yeah. that, um, whenever, because I think you sent it to me via Slack one day, <laughs> like this poem, and whenever <laughs> anybody really comes strong, I was like, I literally tell them, it's like, I really appreciate you for upholding a tradition that has been going on since 1915. <laughs> More and I century. show them this poem, and I'm yeah. like, this was somebody <laughs> doing a more eloquent version of what you're doing right now. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that it's really funny because I, I think one of the episodes we talked about this was Hook, 
Yeah. Because I remember being of a specific age in 1992. I was 15. And I remember, like, I, I would just started reading movie reviews. I just started paying attention to film critics and, like, the occasional, like, article about productions and things like that. And the general consensus among the grown-ups was that Hook was this total, you know, disaster at the time. That, like, you know, it was a troubled production, that, like, it was, you know, it, it squandered its start, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, even Steelber Steven Spielberg seemed kind of not thrilled with it. I was not those kids who watched it on VHS over and over who were just a few years younger than me. Mm. So even my perspective in 1992, those kids in some cases were like pre-critical. I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying they're unintelligent. Of course, these are like smart, observant. But even kids a couple years younger than me, their experience with that film was totally different. So now they are like, what hook? We get more stuff about hook than just yeah. about anything yeah. else. People love that movie. And I'm saying just a little bit older, that was not well considered at the time. But those kids weren't reading reviews at the time. Yeah. And so there's things like that that it looks obvious in retrospect, but like even at the time, there were slightly different vibes happening, you know? So what was the, it, was that your movie? Was that kind of your gateway into like film criticism and to being like, oh, this is actually something, this isn't just to sit back and eat popcorn. This is something you can actually digest and sort of reconcile with your own feelings. Let me tell you what. My dad had a book of Roger Ebert reviews that I would just like read over and over. Like, and then I would get a new, because he would update it every year. Yeah, yeah. Because so that I would just like go through those. I think I remember reading like his rotten review of Batman mm. and being sort of confused because I thought everyone like it made all the money. So I. You know what I mean? I just thought everyone just loved Batman. <laughs> Bat and then like and the in Ninja retrospect, movie, I was like, everybody loves this, right? Right. Yeah. right. Even today, like, ultimately, by the way, I don't think that there's ever that big a disparity between critics and audiences. I think for the most part, if you look at the most popular movies of all time, the movies that, like, if someone says, this is my favorite movie, it's usually something that the critics and audiences sort of agree on. Mm. Yeah, know, I think for the most part. I, but I will say that it's those cult films or those movies that, um, you know, people saw a lot as kids before they were... You know, before they were reading movie reviews or absorbing the culture beyond maybe their houses or their friends or their communities, that those are sort of the interesting things. Well, the thing that, I mean, you know, you talk about the the advent of film criticism in general, but then when you talk about the tomato meter, what have the changes to the tomato meter been that you've witnessed before this podcast? And then like during this podcast, has there been any any movement? I mean, I'm just, I'm curious as like somebody who kind of knows the inner gears like yeah like i look at you you're kind of like hugo in the clock tower and like you know how all the gears turn and like all that stuff so i'm just curious from your perspective like how has the tomato meter sort of evolved okay wow. so yeah. excluding after darks and excluding the time we did like all 12 saw movies or whatever yeah, yeah. 54 films changed tomato meters during the course of um like oh, wow. before it was published wow. and then, and some of these are there's I have a, I have a reason for some of these. Like for example, when um, the Dial of Destiny came out, I went back and cleaned up all the old Indiana Jones things. So Kingdom of the Crystal Skull went from seventy eight percent with two hundred and seventy three reviews to seventy seven percent with three hundred and eight reviews because I found a bunch of reviews from oh, two thousand seven. Okay. Yeah, um, that's what we do when we go back and clean these things up. The thing is, a lot of these things, the points are not. It doesn't move that much, but the last dragon went from rotten to fat, fresh, for example. Yeah. I mean, that's that was, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is <laughs> because it's not just me going back doing it. Like we approve a whole new list of critics every year, and one yeah. of the things that one of the things that I love about the Tomato Meter or Rotten Tomatoes is that it's it all goes in the pot. It doesn't matter what country, what time period, retrospective, contemporaneous. It all goes in the pot, which sort of can show how a movie was perceived over a long period of time. And The Last Dragon is one of those movies I think people were like, hmm, interesting when it came out. But again, people love that movie. The other thing about something like The Last Dragon is one of the things that's been kind of fascinating and wonderful to watch over the course of working at Rotten Tomatoes is just how many more women, people of culture, col sorry, women, people of color, LGBTQIA+, critics there are, who are in the pool of critics mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Because something like um, 
some of these films that got mixed reviews in the 80s, there weren't, you know, like the audience the, the it didn't reflect to the audience exactly yeah. right so you that that's not it's not just people watching movies when they were kids it's also you know like black people watching coming to america it's not to say that like these are bad critics who didn't like it or whatever it's just that it like it's to them differently exactly that's I, I, what i'm saying yeah, yeah there's exactly. a very big difference between hey this joke is gonna land a lot better for mark because it's a joke about van halen <laughs> it's going to be a lot more sensitive. Yeah, I mean, but if it's a good joke about Van Halen, you're going to you're going to yeah. laugh even you're going to laugh even. Yeah. Even, you're gonna laugh even I appreciate however. it in a different way. You appreciate it in yeah. a different way and so for you the sort of like ability to make a joke about your favorite thing in mm -hmm. a way that you still find funny is going to be infinitely more impactful for than for me where I'm like unless it's about hot for teacher I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it's one of those things where it, beauty is sort of in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. And I think that it's, I, but I think that, you know, the way that, the, what one of the things I love about Rotten Tomatoes is that, and the wide swath of critics that we now have that are reviewing all these movies is that it does enlighten you to, as anybody who's consuming art, to kind of try to look at it from your perspective, but also try to get outside of your own box and yeah. try to look at it and see what the movie is saying and who it might be saying it to. Yeah. And I think that that's a very important thing that I don't know if it was always prevalent in film criticism. I think I think back in the early days, I mean, you're talking about some guy in 1897 who's watching it. Like, they don't even know what they're looking at necessarily yet. Yeah. And so this whole thing is in evolution and is still in evolution. And to have people like Tim Ryan in a place like this that are charting that evolution and sort of like, it's almost like you're looking at a growth chart, you know? You're looking at a chart of evolution when it comes to film criticism. And that's why you have somebody who has really found their calling, I think, yeah. in, in somebody like Tim Ryan. And mm -hmm. it was a pleasure to have that two minutes every week that sometimes was three or four minutes. And it could have been 10 minutes because oh, it was great for us to give perspective and it really kind of lit a fire under Jacqueline and I to be like, all right, we got to follow this now. <laughs> like, yeah. This guy's I, bringing facts. This guy's bringing quotes. We really got to up our game for the yeah. main conversation. I, just I, can't be vibes. I, yeah. I, I, you know, and I appreciate both of you very much. And I thank you for all your kind words. I, there was this one that I did specifically for you. <laughs> specifically. <laughs> and that's when, like, I was like, I am not, no disrespect to the Mighty Ducks, like, I have very limited things mm -hmm. to say about these movies that got middling reviews and that audience scores are not particularly high either. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Let's throw the whole thing out. Let's try to find movies, sports teams named after movies. Ah, <laughs> oh, Which is very, it was, just, yeah, I mean, which I, you know, and you were like, what about the Predators? And I'm like, I don't think, no, it's like, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> the National <laughs> Predators, it's a thing. It's, I mean, they're a team. Anyway. The White Sox were named that before Field of Dreams? Wow. They were named oh, that yeah. before Field of Dreams. Oh, there was yeah. that whole scandal. Yeah. Um, I, 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 we, we appreciate you here. And there is one more question I have to ask you just so we can sure. clean everything up. Uh, is Paddington 2 better than Citizen Kane? Okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> this is literally like so asking a, a Vietnam guy know, about rice patties. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> so, okay. So I'll just say this, that like during the pandemic, like I said, I've been doing this thing where I've been going back and finding reviews of old films. Um, and during the pandemic, we had so little contact with the outside world. <laughs> like, I'm in my basement, <laughs> um, you know, adding these reviews for these old films. And I just was like, oh, that's interesting. Someone from the Chicago Tribune didn't like Citizen Kane. Huh. I guess I'm adding that. <laughs> I didn't think to, like, contact PR or anything. Yeah. Oh, I remember that, too, I, like, yeah. Because then all of a sudden, it was shortly after the Oscars, someone tweeted out, like, oh, looks like Paddington's 100% and Citizen Kane is 99 And I'm like, okay, also, this is not how this works. It's not, that doesn't mean it's, it's a percentage of critics. It doesn't there you mean go. it's better. Oh, yep. man, but it was, everyone got in on that, man. Yeah, everyone weird. got in on that. Even the director talked about it. Like, this was, this was national news. I will say, Paddington, too delightful film. I'm not no and like this is the th this is ultimately the thing like I don't we're talking about Rotten Tomatoes is wrong we're talking about scores and things it's all part of a discussion it's all you know hopefully that it's a jumping off point and if you don't agree with critics like see why you don't agree see yeah. why they said what they said I think it's just I, I I often when you say um think about being cornered at a party or something like that I'm always like my my default is like always defend film critics because they're watching something for the first time they don't know how 
you're going to react. They don't know how yeah. you're going to react. They're watching they, it before they they even get a sense of how the general public's going to feel yeah. about exactly. it. Exactly. I think the thing that and the thing that you're really driving home here is that I, you know it, it is nice to have information and it's wonderful to have resources where you can investigate the stuff you love or the stuff that you're curious about that you'd know nothing of, but have some confidence in your own opinion. Fair. You know, keep oh, your yeah. uh, keep your memories, keep your uh, cherish them. I I remember being in a the theater and laughing so hard at Naked Gun two and a half. And that's why I'll say that's the best of the Naked Gun movies. Is it in the in the general public size? Probably not, but I think it's fresh. Oh, it's so. the funniest. It, it's the funniest one to me. Th- that's the smell of fear. Right? That's the smell of fear. <laughs> that's not the final insult. It's not the final insult. That's thirty three and a third. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean look, also, <laughs> I love those movies. You have to remember, <laughs> they're great. What is that judging on? What are the critics judging it on, and what are you judging it on? Yeah. You're judging it on an incredible fun day at the movies. The critics may be judging it for a whole host of other things that you could give a damn about. I don't care about the cinematography. I want to ask everyone this one last question because we didn't get to a lot of things on the podcast, as I'm sure we'll when we talk about our final mailbag. There's some movies that we didn't get. One that you wish we would have gotten to that you would have liked to have seen. Oh man, if Tim? if there was one that we that I I just think that we really could have gotten deep into this conversation and this is such a this is such a small movie that people may not even remember it i looked up because i wanted to watch it eddie and the cruisers 2 eddie lives and really yes and because it's it's almost impossible to find streaming or anywhere and i was like man this thing's got to be like 10 percent of the tomato it's got to be five percent because you know just nobody really cared about when it came out but i loved watching that movie and i looked it up last night it is 71% on wow. the tomato meter. So you're damn right, Eddie Lives. Tim, do you have one that you wish we would have gotten to? Ishtar. Ishtar. Oh, because wow. Because yeah. that was, like like I said, when I started paying, there was the Far Side cartoon, which was Hell's Video Store, and it was all copies of Ishtar. Like, that thing was so toxic in its day. It was. But I went back and read some reviews at the time, and a few people were like, this is hilarious. Yeah. It just sort of had this terrible reputation, but, like, that reputation was not, like, totally universal. And I know I, Nathan Rabin, for example, went back and rewatched it. He was like, this is funny. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it just cost a lot of money. It had some big stars. Like, it did. But, you know, again, like, who's to say, who knows how, who knows how it's going to, how it's going to age. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the thing. And, and that's why, you know, we, we could have just kept doing this show and kept, it, you know, oh, featuring stuff like mine. Ishtar and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But the movie that What's Jacqueline yours? thinks should have been on the show for one last defense, is... Listen, for my horny girlies, we didn't get to 365 days or after, and both of those would have been epic episodes, but I think Mark would have blushed too much. It would have been, it would have been an, <laughs> an enlightening experience for me. <laughs> I'm sure. It would have been me forcing Mark to watch basically softcore porn. But <laughs> the knowledge, whether it's a movie Jacqueline wanted to do or I wanted to do or somebody else just said, hey, we should totally tackle this movie. The I think the anchor to this show is as much fun as it was hosting with you, Jacqueline. The, the Just the thing you could rely on every week was Two Minutes with Tim yeah. getting us on the yeah. right track and getting us to talk about the things that are really important to people about the movie and the most important aspects of it. So, yeah. Tim Ryan. Thank you so much. And again, it's so funny to be sitting here with you since I spent, <laughs> you guys spent so much time in my head, in my uh, ears. Wow. And so to actually be here is kind of amazing. So. Yeah, that's yeah. why I tried to dress like a radio DJ. Um, oh, yeah, no, you. you look like, is, no. you, you need like a fruity drink with an umbrella the way you're dressed right now, man. You got your shades like going. We got Tim and Jack, we're going to be giving away some Fandango oh tickets later on today. We got Brian Perez coming to the studio next. Uh, this is trippy. Yeah. Tim Ryan, you are, you're the best. Thank you for everything you you've done You guys, thank for the you show. so much too. Brian, Lucy, everybody thank you so much it's been an honor to do it and thanks for having confidence in me to you know oh you'll be back I don't think this is the last time I'm gonna sit across from Mark talking in a podcast setting just not gonna be under the rotten tomatoes in the wrong umbrella Leaving one calming presence and bringing it to another one. Okay ladies and gentlemen I have to let you have a peek inside the hood as producer Brian Perez sits down I will go ahead and say this We ran this podcast, but as we said, we started it in the pandemic. And that is sort of like getting a car as it's running and jumping inside of it as it's going downhill. You're not really thinking about what direction you're going. If you're on a road, you're just in it. And when Brian joined the podcast, that was when we finally felt like, oh, no, this is a train on tracks with a time schedule and like it we're not was, gonna crash. It, we're not gonna crash. And that calming presence is like what kept us going literally for the past uh, you know, two years, the majority of the podcast. And then also editing on top of that too. So yeah, I will beforehand. say, yeah, like this was 
This was such a, an added thing. And I will say that it's a relationship that I like. It's not that I don't like you, Mark. But it's one that, <laughs> yeah. that I will continue. Because he produces my <laughs> he other... kind of is. He produces my other podcast, The Awards Tour. Like, He's, this relationship was... He was not so sick of me that he decided, yeah. you know what? Let's do that girl again. More. I, I needed more of that chaotic energy in my life. <laughs> I've always I'm too said, calm. Ah! I'm too relaxed. I need <laughs> stress. Brian I mean, needs chaos. Yeah. And That's... Jacqueline needs the, the I, I would say, the structured approach that Brian brings Absolutely. to a professional <laughs> setting. Now, he, I would call him our rock star producer, but by the way he's dressed, you already knew that if you're watching yeah. this episode. I mean, I had he to looks dress up clean. The... He's, he's got a growing career in comedy now. He's basically just doing what I do, except he's much better at many more things. <laughs> <laughs> so you edit and you were kind of like the apprentice for uh, for a hot second there. And then you took the producing reins and just and just ran with it. Yeah. yeah. So the history of my history with this company is through Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. It's weird to think about. I came about in April of 2021 as the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, our buddy, Ru Christian Ruval Cabo was the editor beforehand. But he's like, I don't like. I remember that guy. Yeah, he's like, yeah. I don't like editing audio. <laughs> like, you're yeah, the audio yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to do podcasts? And I was like, OK, what's uh, Rotten Tomatoes is wrong about? <laughs> so I came on and produced, produced you. Lucy was producing with you guys. I met you guys. I was editing behind the scenes. And then um, she went on maternity leave and I took over her duties. And um, yeah, it, it's been fun since. Yeah. Like and it's, it's, you know, it, it's it's great because you and I have known each other for a long time. And so getting to work with you in a capacity like this and just having somebody to really, because the one thing I think that Jack will agree on that, that we sort of need is just a little bit of like, hey, guys, let, let's get this thing done. Yeah. Like, like, let's just, I, I just need an answer on this. Just give me a yeah. yes or no. And so, and that's usually all it takes. But a follow up is definitely good for both of our needed. email activities. He's oh, a yeah. human yeah. follow up. That's yeah, what Brian yeah, Perez is. Yeah. He's a human reminder on your calendar. Because you don't check email. And I think that I answered and I did it. And between those two, it's, it's a, there's some missives that have to be resent. And yeah. that's okay. Ma I'll email Mark like in a group message and he'll just text me back saying like, I don't like emailing back. I don't like CCing all. I'm not replying all. Not reply all. And this is the opposite with me. If he texts me, I'm like, who died? Why are you texting there's me? There's so many things to keep track of. Like Jacqueline doesn't like texting. Everything's in an email. Mark doesn't like emails. <laughs> well, this or is the thing. Slack. Look at our lives, though. That's Look at our lives. Answer. Mark lives in his text messages with bookers, with your agents, mm -hmm. with whatever. Yeah. If it is not in an email, that is gone to the ether. There is no follow-up that will happen when I look. I'm not looking back at old text messages. Just, no. Are you yeah. Me? No, I, I like get it. random phone calls from numbers I don't recognize, and it turns out to be Jacqueline on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, "How did you? What, what is this number?" There's she's like, number? "Oh, I'm on my fourth phone." And I'm like, uh, wh oh. "Whatever." Yeah. What she's do you juggling want? Yeah. your phone. Listen. Yeah. And by the way, she's not calling with an emergency. She's just no. calling to shoot. What the, are you doing? You know. What are you doing? I'm the only time I can be an actual human being is when I'm outside of Los Angeles proper. Like when I'm at an event, I'll call Mark and be like, "What's going on, man? How you doing?" Yeah. I mean, that's that's really. I'm walking to a movie what's up how's the dog which like the, uh which airport lounge are you in i'm listen i'm about to be in lax listen i i'm I, about to be there as of tomorrow morning tomorrow wow. morning not that yeah. close no i'll be there friday evening uh heading over i'm gonna interview zendaya well, i'm gonna I'm, use this podcast i know this is your moment brian but i will <laughs> just say this i'm gonna interview zendaya and i have kept quiet about this to a level that is not acceptable for me as a black woman now like, are you allowed to say that yeah. you're interviewing Okay. But yeah, are but you yeah. now? Are, are you apprehensive about? It? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Like, Is it? Like, like, are more, you gonna fan girl? Yeah, I'm way more nervous than you should be to interview a woman who is 15 years my junior. But this I like just think something. like I it do gets not. Weird. I think she's amazing. Like mm -hmm. when Issa Rae, who's my age, said to her, it's like, what do you do when you wake up every day and just look around and realize none of these bitches are even close? That's the vibe. <laughs> that is the vibe. Like yeah. she just does. Like it's like I I really appreciate what she does. Nobody's perfect. She is a, you know, whatever. But as far as like putting it out there for black women like her, Serena and Beyonce doing great things. Doing great things. Great. All right, follow that, Brian. <laughs> I, as a Mexican, I don't know. What are, what are you doing in the Mexican community? I don't know. Who should I be following? Uh, well, you talk, mean, you talk about you talk about like like a celebrity that, that that we all get excited to talk to. Yeah. yeah. And you, one of your many hats that you wore was sort of booking the guests and, yeah. and getting oh, yeah. talent in the room. How is was that the easiest part? Was that the most toughest? Who did was you that like the most booking? rewarding? Yeah. Um, I like going through Mark because you have the connections with everybody. Jacqueline, you have connections as well. 
But Mark, you, I love uh, Mark's people will show up. Nobody will <laughs> like the people. No, yeah. that, the Emily pe- V. Gordon, that's you brought true, on, that's and true. she was great. Yeah, no, she's true. Sure. And that was the first time I saw or even heard about the legend of Billie Jean. I yeah. loved it. All yeah. of Jacqueline's contacts are on their yacht in the south of France, they're and they're busy. unavailable, <laughs> yeah, and they yeah. don't have reliable Wi-Fi to come on the show. They're busy. My people just wake up <laughs> and sit in traffic for an hour, and they come to the studio, and yeah. they do a great job, and we love them all. Comedians are better. You got one of my favorite ones. What was his name? Eric Griffin. Uh, Eric Griffin. Like that episode will go down (laughs) in history. I was most unprofessional job because all I did was laugh at that man the entire hour. He just made me laugh. Yeah, we had a a lot of laughs on the show. And and that's one of the things that is really rewarding for me is just being able to talk about movies. And that's like going back to the Schmoes days is like, that's always the way I love talking about movies is is being serious about your feelings towards a film, mm. but also being able to crack jokes during it. And so when you have, uh, you you know, you have an EG in the room, you have Steve Byrne, who did Ace Ventura with oh, us. Yeah. You have Winston Marshall, who came in a bunch of times. His Avatar episode is way yeah, up there for me as far there, as like yeah. just one of the most fun episodes to ever do. Um, who like who are some of your favorite guests? Uh, to, to Eric bring Griffin in? was great. I'll go back to that one because when we were recording it, uh, there was a longer episode in there that I was like, I can't put this in the show. <laughs> this is an after after This dark. is a, I, like, we're a corporation here, oh Eric. I can't God. include any of this. But it was <laughs> so good, though, man, because you still got the vibes of me being like, she definitely laughed for a good 10 minutes about some stuff they cut out right yeah. before we cut back to her. Uh, so you still get that vibe, mm-hmm. even though you didn't hear what it's about. That's yeah. the audio. You should have sent that audio to Christian Rubelkaba. Be yeah, like, yeah. hey, can you handle this one episode yeah, for yeah, me? I'm out of cover town. this, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, the comedians you brought on, Tony Baker was great. Yeah, Tony's great. Um, Tony's awesome, yeah. And actresses like Daniela Pineda was great, talking yeah. about The Cell. Like, a yeah. lot of fun guests. And when Producer Lucy was in charge, uh, she brought on, she got on Topher Grace yeah. uh, to talk about Back to the Future. It was fun looking into the yeah. mirror for an hour. That yeah. was cool. That was, I was absent for that episode, but I was happy for you. Yeah. I was very happy yeah, for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, Topher and I got to tackle some uh, some subjects. Um, Liv Morgan, was, you know, the, the oh, world-famous wrestler yeah. was great. Um, we got to have... Peaches Christ, which I loved for oh, her. For Malignant. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've heard coming on talking about Malignant. Also, yeah, just people that are involved in the movie. We got, uh, we got what's her name from Deep Blue Sea? Um, Saffron Burroughs. Yeah, Saffron. Oh, she was great. She yeah. was so great. Cola from uh, from Ted Lasso yeah. um, coming on. I think or he did. Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys mm-hmm. 2. Yeah. Yeah, man. Was it Jay that did Man on Fire? Jay Ellis? Jay Ellis. Yeah, yeah he did Man on Fire. Jay Ellis yeah. did Man on Fire. I just think that we had like such... I don't know, man. It's just such a great run of people where I was like very excited to see Chance them. the Rapper doing Hot Rod was, that was uh, pretty that was, great. Was that was pretty yeah. sweet too. Just because like I, because for two reasons. One, it was great to talk to Chance the Rapper, yeah. but it was also, I'd never seen Hot Rod. Yeah. And this was the movie that Chance was like, no, no, we got to talk. This is the movie that I, I want to defend. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I've heard of it. I like Andy Samberg. Let's check it out. And I loved it. And so now it's like, now I have a new movie introduced to me. Yeah. And even like as one of the hosts of the show, it's really cool. Like The Legend of Billie Jean was another yeah. one where I had I had heard of this movie vaguely. Yeah. And then you sit down and watch it. Like, this is great. And I will say, too, towards the end, there were movies that I think were personally uh, ones that we liked that got to be a part of it. Like when you got to do the Goofy movie with Danny. Um, yeah. when Andre came in and he did, did he do, what when did Andre He did do? Super Mario Brothers. He did Super Mario mm-hmm. Brothers. Yeah. He came in with the VHS. I was like, this, pe- with the when, shirt, with everything, when people everything, brought yeah. props, I was like, this <laughs> is going, this is going deep in like the best way. I will say somebody we didn't get on who I know is a, is a frequent listener. Uh, that's Dan Peralt. Like we should have gotten, did we get him uh, on for strays? Uh, no, I don't know we didn't. This is what happened. That. We were supposed to get him on, Dan, if you're listening, we were supposed to get him on for strays. But the writer's strike happened, and he uh, couldn't do any press for that movie that he did right. with Will Ferrell, with Will oh, Forte. Yeah, oh, okay. and so, like, he couldn't do anything for that one. But, yeah, he was going to come on but the But the pod. three of us have hung out so much. Oh, my I God, I feel like yeah. we had Dan on the show, like, five times. But he should have been on here. I would say that's another regretful guest that I wish we could have gotten on here. But we got on a ton. He would have been great on the Eddie and the Cruisers 2 episode. <laughs> <laughs> that will never see the light. I'll yeah. do it myself. I'll I have mean, Dan come over. You say this, but there is a chance too, and not to like tease everyone. There is a chance we could be back with certain moments and certain specials, and like you like know, a one off kind like of like a one off kind of thing. If there's yeah. a movie that we feel like there's a good conversation around it, because we've we covered a lot, 165 movies, and I'm not saying that there aren't at least another 200 that we could talk about, but. 
there's something to be said for like, hey, when we come back, it could be a nice little like, boom, we did this one episode with a good guest. And, yeah, just, yeah. you know, a little wizard behind the curtain is that it's just, this is, Rotten Tomatoes is is sort of a an organism and it and it evolves and it changes and it, and it has different areas that it wants to go into. And yeah. so, you know, we're not going anywhere necessarily, but no. it's just a matter of what's next. And I think it's going to be exciting, like to see what you guys are doing with the award show podcast. Yeah. And, you know, whatever the next thing that I get to do here, like I love doing on the street. Where Christian Rubalcaba is is the producer of that show, and it's like, and it's just really fun to get to do different types of things, all within the sort of you know realm of cinema and getting to celebrate it, but also getting to do what I love doing with it, which is laughing a little bit. You know, Jack, when you get to talk award show and you get yeah. to go to all these cool places, and and Brian is just there, uh, he's he's along for the ride, and he's a great sport about it. But you also are great at sort of keeping us on our p's and q's yeah. when we need it. You, oh, yeah. have, you, you have a great producerial touch because I know when you need to get things done, but it's never in like, it, you, you're never mean about it. You're never disciplinarian about it. Yeah. Yet you somehow get the job done and get us here on time. Yeah, you I guys agree. are my children. <laughs> and uh, when we start the show, I'm like, you guys get your energy out. <laughs> get your little giggles okay, out, get the it way. out of the way. I'm not recording anything. And None then, of like, that is inaccurate. Settle yeah. down, settle down. We can use and this then, last five minutes to just vent if you uh, want to. No, no, it's been fun. It's been, and another time. And, yeah, no, I mean, honestly, this is like a dream come true. Like, I started yeah. podcasting like 10 years ago. Yeah. Same. And like, created my, created my own podcast. And like, who would have thought like, I would join a corporation like, in the world of podcasting. Like, 10 years ago, I was like, what yeah. is a podcast? And now yeah. it's like, <laughs> these huge companies want to create that. I'm like, I know how to do that. Like, oh, you can pay me to do that and to talk about movies. Like, I've loved movies all my life. So, yeah. like, to get to hang out with you guys, my friends, and to just, like, talk about movies and laugh about it. Like, holy crap. Like, that's a cool living. And yeah. we did some pretty impressive things in terms of numbers, in terms of stats and all that stuff. I mean, the, the, we have two episodes that are right hovering around uh, half a million views. Yeah. On YouTube, that's Twilight, and we did an episode on the Scream franchise. Yep, yep. Um, Avatar, Suicide Squad, the uh, the M Night Shyamalan movie filmography with Alex Wolf. That's mm-hmm. another one of the all time most viewed ones. And then you look at episode one, the very first episode that went live as the podcast was Spider Man Three, which mm-hmm. is a great movie to kick off with. Yep. And we could not ask for a better guest than Roxy Stride in that episode. The first episode that went live on YouTube was Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. We had Kalinowski in and Mike Count. I mean, you talk about a guy who just knows everything. And at- built for video. Like, that was a face we needed to put on that video. That was the oh, yeah. legitimate yeah. face yeah. of our empire. And Brian's very first episode that you edited yeah. was Mortal Kombat with Brian Tong. Yeah. And that was Mortal Kombat. I believe that was the original Mortal Kombat. No, the that 2021 was, version. That was the 2021 version. Oh, yeah, version. that was you the guys, one with you, uh, Louis Tan. Yeah, yeah. we uh, talked it already. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. we'd already talked about uh, okay. that one. Yeah, you guys yeah. covered the original, which I wish I was there for because I grew up on the original yeah. Mortal Kombat and even Annihilation. Like, I haven't seen I'm it in a while. Li- I'm an Annihilation defender. Yeah? Yeah. I, I got to rewatch it, but I I freaking love those movies. You didn't mention this one, too, because this is a dual medium podcast. We have video, we have audio. I do love that a more recent episode being the Dune episode did so well audio wise. Mm-hmm. So many people listened to that one and so many people listened to the Eternals episode. A lot of people queued up the Eternals when that one came out. Yeah. And yeah. then and then uh, Brian and, and I got to go to the uh, American Cinematheque and then we we got to introduce <laughs> oh, yeah. Dune 1984 that was as cool. part yeah. of the like the, the festival. And that was like, yeah, that's all from this podcast yeah. and it's just it, it's a really cool thing and, and there was a couple like directors that i know that i'm a fan of they were just i i didn't know they were there that night they were in the audience like yeah. just because oh. they wanted to go see dune again oh, wow. yeah. and, and i heard from them and it's like and it was just a really cool thing it's a small world this movie community but it's a huge world and it's a big undertaking and you could not ask for a better lineage of talent behind the scenes that we had here and for brian to help us pull this train into station finally it's you're you're one of one, sir. You are you're truly unique in your talents, and it could not have done this show without you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Definitely. So, sir. what nice things do you have to say about us? Uh, you guys are great. Whenever uh, you're focused and paying attention, and <laughs> so thirty percent of the time we're okay. <laughs> no, I mean, you're... listen. There's a lot of squirrel that happens in this podcast, but we know y'all listen for that. Also, I will shout out to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Most, again, podcasts don't make it past four episodes. We made it to almost four years. We still have, I think, great ratings on pretty much every single service that we've been a part of. The number of people that have reached out since the podcast has been ending. I've gotten a lot of DMs, a lot of texts being like, oh, my God, I'm sad you guys are leaving, but I'll know I'll listen to something else. And we got a lot of um, last minute emails. Uh, Mark, do you want to read any of these ones? Yeah. So this one is uh, this is Adam D from England. And he says, hi, Mark, Jacqueline and Tim. He says, having picked up my jaw from the floor after your announcement at the end of the last episode, I decided to send you the question I've been meaning to write for at least the last two years. RT is wrong seems to be focused on the idea of what terrible film do you actually like and why? My question wants to flip that on its head. Which highly regarded film by both critics and audiences do you actively dislike? Critics and audiences. Yeah. So it's got to be a double roses for them and a double whammy for us. Is there a movie that comes to mind that... Everybody just seems to be fawning over and you're just not feeling it. Uh, Midsommar. I don't know what the what the audience rating on that one is, oh, but Midsommar for me was uh, not your thing. I'll do some no. research. No. And I think get... it's got a fairly high audience rating as well. Yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah. It's you, it's still divisive though. Yeah. 83% certified fresh okay. and 63% so it's got audience a little bit, score. Audience score is a little bit, but I just... Don't dig hate. that movie. Yeah. Like, I don't want to say hate because it is an art form and a lot yeah. of people put a lot of work into it. There's some performances in that that are nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I could have done without that entire movie. I also could have done without that movie justifying that brand of cinema, which I think needs to just... Which is still of, going. Yeah, mm, and it needs yeah. to go away. Yeah. In my opinion. Again, that is my That's, like... Yeah. And the, I, the score of the critic score of this one is low, but it was also still pretty beloved and it won a ton of Oscars. So I don't know if you could say that that's the case, but like Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. That yeah. one, I could yeet it into the sun and we would be all right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that one Rami. was like. Uh, Sorry, Rami. <laughs> his performance is great. Uh, yes, I feel it. like others. I, <laughs> I'm saying. His performance was what it needed to be to win an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there I were feel other be better ones. Like Bradley Cooper lost for A Star Is Born that same year. Was that that same year? I think sounds right. Yeah, yeah. he lost for A Star Is Born because he was all up in his director's bag. Mm. But he actually did sing. He sung live, and then he did everything he did for Maestro. The idea that both Maestro and uh, A Star Is Born didn't get Bradley Cooper an Oscar, but Bohemian Rhapsody got Rami Malek one. I think he, that dude talks about that in therapy. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I it would. Him to this I'm day. nothing against Rami Malek. I would just be talking about that in therapy. I would. I have a movie that I agree with the audience more, and I don't even agree. I, I can't even get to where the audience is with it. This movie's 93% certified fresh with critics, 79% on the audience score. And it's a movie that I appreciate, and I actually was really into this movie for a while. And I it just lost me. I felt like I, maybe it's me. Maybe I need to rewatch it. But... Drive with Ryan Gosling. Uh, I thought oh, started wow. out so damn hot and it was so strong. And then it just kind of keeps fizzling out for me. And mm. I thought Albert Brooks was great in it. I thought oh, Gosling yeah. was great. I just, I cannot get into the that, last that, bit. I just can't do it. And so that's, that, that, that's your movie for me, Adam. But again, I think that what this show has taught me is that if I truly dislike a movie, maybe some of it is me. <laughs> and I need <laughs> yeah, to go yeah. back and just be honest with it. Because yeah. there's movies I just know I'm never going to get into. Anna Karenina is a movie. <laughs> the, yeah. There's been a bunch of versions. There's one with Jude Law and Kira Knightley. And I sat there and I was maybe a little hungover when I went to the screening. And I hated every second of being there. It felt like homework. <laughs> it's barely fresh with critics. The audience is 50%. <laughs> it's just one of those. And, and it's just, it's not for me. It, yeah. I, and I get it. And I, everybody can have it. If you love the book, maybe you're going to love the movie. It's not for me. There's some Oscar movies that are like that where I'm like, it's so beloved and it's so, it won Best Picture, Best Director, whatever. Like, like the power of the dog wasn't for yeah, me. Yeah, okay. what, I yeah. I tried watching it. Everyone's like, this is the greatest thing. This is so well directed. And I was like, I was kind of bored. But again, it's probably me saying like, hey, like, let's get mm -hmm. some action in I mean, there, like some <laughs> jokes in there. Some people, some people probably said the same thing. I liked the power of the dog. I was okay that it lost. <laughs> yeah, but but it won direction. It did one direction. Yeah, uh, which I don't remember others that were nominated that year. But I feel like also like to go back to the question, it's not as fun to just hate on a movie like you're yes. saying, like, 
maybe it's me. <laughs> like, yeah. like, could be. So I mean, you don't want to say like, hey, like everyone loves this movie. It's so beloved. Let me just like crap all over it. Like that doesn't, I feel like that doesn't make for a fun episode. It's more of like, let's defend Teen Witch. Yeah. Or let's defend these movies that we love as a, like uh, when, like the movies we grew up with. And now we're like, oh, it's we understand it's not great, but it's still so fun. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see what those movies of today end up being like. What movies of today that we've dismissed end up being the ones that like really hit mm -hmm. with the different generation. I mean, something like Super Mario Brothers is probably going to be a movie like that. Like the re the new one, the animated it's one. It's rotten. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's rotten and it, it's going to move forward. Uh, I look, I, I, I think the other part of this, too, is you're right. It's not just about bashing movies and being like, hey, this one sucks. It is about sort of the conversation, but I like that we're having the conversation. That's like the best part is the fact that we actually want to sit and say, hey, why did you dig this? Why didn't I dig this? And, and sort of examining that in a different way. Yeah, the fact yeah. that we got to have the conversation and the fact that all of you loyal listeners and viewers out there got to be a part of that because it's one thing just to argue with somebody you've never met before online about a movie and yelling at each other and you lose a lot in that context but here just to have a full-on fleshed out well-produced structured <laughs> organized conversation that can also be freewheeling and 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 you know loose and go in a lot of different tangents and stuff like that it's been such a rewarding journey for me and i think that if anything what i hope the legacy of this podcast would be is to let people know that you can have a difference of opinion and you can still laugh about it and you can still find some common ground and maybe say, you know what, maybe part of it is me and I should go back and kind of revisit what this thing is we're talking about. And maybe your opinion can change because there's definitely been movies that like the conversation and maybe going back to it did change my opinion. Because if Rotten Tomatoes can be wrong, then I can be wrong, too. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go. We got to go. And Wrap yeah. up. Yeah. Um, it took us 165 episodes to make it that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of great guests over the years. But we had uh, Winston A. Marshall's number 10. Yeah. He had 10 appearances. No, he was number one in the list of... Uh, he had 10 appearances. He's yeah. number one. Yeah, yeah. And then Roxy right there on his heels, nine appearances. Jay Washington and Dreen Ariano tied for seven apiece. So a lot of great returning guests, a lot of great celebs. And uh, uh, Brian, I guess the, I'll give you the first of the final words here. Um, I've said it all pretty much. Uh, thank you guys so much. I will say you guys are the best. Uh, Mark, you're so talented in what you do and your stand up. You're hilarious, Jack. And your, your movie knowledge is just amazing. And your work ethic, your, your work ethic too, Mark. <laughs> when, uh, it, when it needs to be there, it's there. When, when it's, it's there, there. I mean, let's be real. It's also there on my knowledge. When it needs to be when there. It, again, <laughs> when it needs to be there. When you yeah. plug me in, I work just fine. <laughs> but no, this is a dream job and I'm so happy I get to do it every day. And thank you guys for being a part of it. Couldn't have done it without you, my man. Same. Hey. Um, listen, what I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> joking about that. I've said enough on this podcast. Uh, I want to thank you, Mark, for for just, again, being a great uh, person to go through this journey with. It's I would not have wanted to do it with anyone else. I could not and would not have done it with anyone else. Um, you're really a joy to work with. And anyone that works with you understands that, which is one of the reasons why when you put up the bad signal, people came and showed up. So I, uh, you know, I'd like to thank me as well, because <laughs> I really was. And the only reason I had to give myself my flowers is because after listening to so many episodes of this podcast, my mom's favorite host is Jacqueline. And so she asked me how Jacqueline's doing oh, before no! she, she hears Jacqueline on NPR all the time. And she's like, well, you know, Jacqueline, she's just so smart and she just knows so much about movies. And I'm like, mom, did, did you still have my Return of the Jedi collectible no. glasses? I'm so, on the show too, mom. It, this was, this is, there's nobody else that I think could have pulled off this podcast um, other than Jacqueline Coley. There's a reason why she is so talented and successful and gets to jet set all over the world and interview the biggest stars on planet Earth because she is one of them. You are one of one. And I'm just a dude who was lucky enough to sit across from you and talk Stop. movies. So for the entire gang here in front of the, the cameras, behind the scenes, the entire staff here at RT is Wrong, from, from graphics and everybody else who has contributed and pitched into this show, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of Jacqueline's heart, to all of you and to all the fans out here who kept this show running for so long. And we get to leave on our own terms and we may come back and visit y'all from time to time. So yeah. I'll leave you with a quote from a movie that I love using for any big life event or any minor life change. It always fits. This movie's 82% certified fresh on the tomato meter from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And it's the quote that y'all know. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. 